Well, friends, let me welcome our guest, Dr. Cardona, Professor Emeritus Linguistics from University of Pennsylvania. And we are very lucky to have him here. I'm sure most of you are attending his workshop, which is delivering from Pune. Well, friends, uh, today we are going to have an interactive session. So, there's not going to be a lecture, but he wants you to ask him questions, and that's how the whole program will go. Without taking much of our time, because we have only one hour, I will start asking questions first, and then all you can start, sir. It has been acknowledged by various linguistic scholars, like from Bloomfield to Stahl, Chomsky, that uh, Paninian grammar has, they have a debt of, for the Western linguistic uh, theory, they have a debt of uh, Paninian grammar. So from, how do they, why do they say that? Why do they say that? It's an interesting question. Uh, I'm afraid the answer will be very long. A, of these people who say these things, Maurice um, Leonard Bloomfield, whom you may have heard of. Leonard Bloomfield was an American linguist who wrote a book called Language. And he, his uncle, Maurice Bloomfield, was a famous Vedic scholar. He, Maurice Bloomfield, together with some of his students, compiled the uh, Vedic Concordance, which is now online. You can access it online. And Vedic variants. And he wrote some, he wrote the major work on the Atharva Veda, uh, and studies of them. And he also studied Panini to some extent, very little. One, one of his colleagues told me that he had the Kashika on his bedside table next to his bed. And he said that Panini's work, Yashtanyayi, was one of the great monuments of human intelligence. And that, that he, when he said that, it was in the, in the 1930s. And people keep repeating that. They keep repeating that without really knowing why. I mean, I, I, I'm sorry to, have to say this, but I think it's true. And they claim that, f for example, there, and, they, and, and Panini is imitated to some extent. For example, there was a book by Chomsky and Halle sound patterns of English, in which the last rule is, in English it is A goes to A, and it is A, uh, A, uh, the last sutra on the Ashtanhyay, as some of you may know. Now, in the 1960s, P. B. Pandit, I don't know if you have heard of him, Prabodh Bechar Das Pandit, a very famous linguist uh, who was not just a linguist, but he was an excellent Sanskritist. This is what people don't realize. His father, Bechar Das Doshi, is a, is a giant in, in, in Prakrit studies. Uh, and TB uh, had studied Panini and knew him very well, although he never really worked on him in publishing. And he said, Panini has had many avatars. He has had Bloomfield, he has had Chomsky. By this he meant that everybody claims to be doing what Panini did without knowing what Panini did. That is, in other words, they're saying what I'm doing is what Panini did. 
and since it's since he was a great man by definition, therefore I am great. Uh, well, this is, it can, it can seem amusing, but it ultimately should not be amusing because what happens is this. Since they say what Panini did is what I'm doing, therefore I can say that what I'm doing is what Panini did. And therefore I can interpret Panini's system as being my system. Consequently, you have over the ages, over the generations, Panini being called a Bloomfieldian, Panini being called a transformationalist, a Chomskyan transformationalist. All of it is true in part, but none of it is true completely. So this is my feeling about what you said. Uh, yeah, and before we go to you, I would also, uh, during, your, during your lectures from Pune, you have been saying that translating some basic concepts or nuances or such things, cultural, this thing into English, I say here, maybe French or German, is not agreeable to you. And I would continue that. Even the punctuation and those modern this thing to use in while printing Sanskrit, you don't agree with. So something on that. Okay. The first one is a very serious question. Translating. I was I came from a very lovely session just a few minutes ago in which some students recited Pani. They recited the Akshara Samannaya or the Shiva Sutra. And they, trend, uh, they said, uh, the person there, quite innocently, I'm sure, said the phonemes of Sanskrit. Now, anytime you use a term like phoneme, you're using a term which has a very special meaning in a very special scientific tradition. And the question always is, does it mean the same thing in one tradition that it does in the other. And this is very rarely true. True translation is a very difficult thing. That is, it, you have to assume that one word has an exact counterpart in the other language. Let me give you two examples of this, and because it's Indian English. There was a is, there was a word in Sanskrit, ghata, ghada, in Hindi. Generally translated, what do you translate the word in English as? Pot. One translation, pot. Other translation, I've heard jug, j u g. Neither is a word that and. American English speaker would understand from that. A pot, first of all, does not have the, the, the lakshana, the specific characteristic of a ghata, of a ghata is the kambu griva, right? That's the basic part that defines it. A pot in English never has that shaped neck. So it's not a pot. A jug. A jug for an English speaker has a handle. And Ghata has no handle. So how can you translate it? it? There are two cultural things. Now there's a very famous Nyaya in Sanskrit, the Sochi Kataha Nyaya. Sochi, everybody knows, is a needle. Kataha. What is a kataha? Well, it's a kadhai, right? Everybody knows that. Actually, it's not a kadhai, it's a kadha. Those of you who, you, you know, when you attend Indian weddings, you have these enormous pots in which you cook routines for everybody. Now, the, the principle is that you start with something small, suti, and you progress to do a larger thing, the kata. Or kata ha. 
how do you translate this word kataha? Years ago, I had to translate, I said walk, W-O-K. Oh, people were so upset. How can you use this word walk to translate it? I said, what would you say? Pot, Fry, pa frying pan. Mm -mm, mm -mm. First of all, a pot is not shaped the same way. Secondly, for an English speaker, a frying pan has a handle. And a, a kataha never has a handle, not one handle. And not that kind of handle, not the long, that's this handle. Secondly, if you go to a Chinese restaurant, you see the wok. It's a Chinese word. And what is the wok? It cut, it cut hand. Shaped this way, it's flat on the bottom, and it's two handles. So why not translate it wok? Because people don't like that. In other words, you have cultural items that are very difficult to translate, and scientific terms that are very difficult to translate, to transpose from one language to another it, in the full understanding of the term. And we have to be, this is, any translator will tell you that. If you're translating poetry, if it's, even if you're translating prose or you're translating scientific literature, to get the precise term that has the precise signification and connotations is very, very hard. Now, punctuation. This is just a prejudice of mine. Western languages have certain punctuations. We have a full stop, have a comma, a semicolon, dot, and comma, and then we have punctuation marks. Now, those of you who have, who have looked at Sanskrit manuscripts know none of this occurs in any manuscript. What do you find in the manuscript? Danda. That's it. Either single danda or double danda. Nothing else. Danda is the only punctuation mark. If you have, instead of quotation marks, you have iti. Iti is a quotation mark. So why impose on that a Western method of punctuation? Well, they think they're making things easy for you. Sometimes they're making things more difficult for you because the punctuation that the editor puts in is his interpretation. Why not allow the text to speak to you and you have your interpretation of the text? And it'll be uh, given its intonation. For example, a question came up after the workshop. A student said to me, Sir, how would you understand and punctuate the simple Sanskrit sentence, Graman Pratigachati? I said, that depends on what you mean. If you mean by this, Nagaram Gatwa, Graman Prati Gatsati. He went first to the city and he came back to the village. That's one thing. But you can also mean Graman Udishya Gatsati. And that would have to be given a different intonation. One is Graman Prati Gatsati, and one is Graman Prati Gatsati. In other words, in one place it is in Vasarga, and in another place it is a Karma Pravachaniya. And they have very different functions. Now, how about if your man gives a punctuation? He, everywhere, he puts prati with the verb. That means he's giving it a particular interpretation, and he's forcing you to understand it that way. You should not be forced to understand it that way. So punctuation, again, is a very tricky thing uh, for the reader and the hearer. Uh, that's Namaste, sir. I have two questions. Uh, one is a specific question. You referred to the concept of phoneme just now. 
in many sanskrit texts uh, basically the primary grammar text it is seen that uh, the term varna is translated as syllable and i have seen i have seen many university uh, teachers translating the word varna in the same way is there any other interpretation of the term varna which goes near syllable this is one question and another question which has a wider scope so there are many undergraduate students over here so what do you suggest them what is the road map for study of sanskrit and linguistics and the underlying assumption is you have done so much that is there anything left now for doing much 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 remains to be done much remains to be done okay the first question is varna to be understood as meaning syllable but don't forget that you also have another sanskrit word akshara now an akshara in the pratishakya you have a definition of this for akshara now what this means is a swara a vowel is an akshara it doesn't mean it does not mean that the swara by itself has to be an akshara it means that the swara can be an akshara and any yanjana with a swara can also be an akshara in other words it's what in english we call a syllable but varna by itself is not is not necessarily a syllable it's a sound The problem is that the term this is it's a very interesting question the problem is that the terms uh can overlap so for example if 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 you consider in the paninian system panini says atha shabdanu shasana i think that's the first beginning you can argue about that uh and patanjali refers to the akshara samannaya now this is akshara if you look at the taitiriya pratishakya it begins with atha varna samannaya na akshara samannaya but varna samannaya and it proceeds much in the same way that is panini has a e u n r r r etc the pratishakya has has a a a e e u that is it gives all of the different prasva dirgha pluta of the vowels but they are the individual sounds and none of them is necessarily a syllable they're sounds so just leave it sounds what's wrong with that Now about panini and what remains to be done. I still remember when I was still young, many many years ago, in 1965. Uh, I was talking to a not a very great pundit. Later I met some much better ones. Uh, and i said can we read mahabhashya together and he said ah mahabhashya mahan samudra ha it's true it's this great ocean panini is an endless study you think you know it when you start ah i know it you know a little more than you start to realize how little you know and the more you learn the more you see that you don't know that much it becomes more and more difficult to understand the full ramifications especially in very you know details of prakriya that become extremely difficult uh, and in these days of uh paninian grammar being formalized by people in iits and such you you have to be explicit about the steps that you take and uh 
recently I was uh, discussing a paper that had been written on the samasanta suffix, uh, samasanta units. And Spanini has a section, within the Tathita section, there is a subsection that says samasantaha. And the question comes up within the tradition, what is, let's say you have a sutra that like such as Rajaha Sakhinyashtat. Well, this introduces this pratyaya, tadhita pratyaya, tat. And it introduces it as a samasanta such that the uttarapada is rajan, ahar, or sakhi, sakhi. Is that samasanta added after you have the samasa? Is it added to the vigraha vakya, alaukika vigraha vakya? Let's say that you have mahat su rajan su, from which you would derive either mahan raja or maharajaha. As alternatives. To get to these two alternatives, you have this alokika vidraha vakya, which is mahatsu, rajansu, that is two pratipadikas, rajan and mahat and rajan, with two su, with one su bending repeated, su, su. That is the prathama ikavachana and the su. Do you add this touch to that whole Mahavakya, that whole Vakya at the end? Do you add it to the Uttarapada? Or do you add it after you form the Samasa? These are issues that were discussed by people like Nagesha in the if, if you read Siddhanta Komudi, you see that Bhattoji immediately tells you that this is added either to the Uttarapada or to the Vigrahavakya. And then he gives examples. If you read Nadesha, in the, uh, that is, Bhattoji says this in the Pradhama Norama. If you read Bhatt, if you read Nagesha in the uh, no 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 Shabdaratna if you read there in his commentary on the Pradhama Norama you see that he takes a point of view that and if he says if it is Uttarapadat that's asamichina that's not correct it has to be part of the Vigrahavakya. Now you have arguments, for, and the arguments are very detailed questions of the prakriya. How does the derivation proceed? And such issues become extremely complex. They can be made explicit. You don't have to be a computational linguist. linguist. I, refuse, I refuse to believe that. You can be an ordinary Sanskritist who knows how to think formally and knows how to put parentheses there. <laughs> That's all you need. But you have to understand how these things are related to each other. And this calls for a certain way of thinking formally. And such answers, just such questions keep coming up. So the more you know, the more questions come up, and the more answers you give, the more more questions come up. So it's, it's almost an endless quest. That would be my answer. Professor, uh, I've been a student of archaeology also. And when we talk about the interpretation of the social systems, 
one of the method seeds or system seeds that of structure added. Now it is told to us that this methodology has been derived from the studies and understanding of Dr. Sosa. who was a professor of probably Indo-European linguistics or comparative philology. And in a way, his Sanskrit studies, his understanding of the Sanskrit, that has prompted for this development of structuralism. It has been used for interpreting mythology by Strauss Levy by Chomsky and so many others and also by archaeologists. Now there is something like post-structuralism. What I mean to say is that with the studies of Pani proper, uh, can there be very important possibilities or distinct possibilities of developing tools of methodology or research which you can in this uh, in modern context. A name was mentioned here, uh, which you may not know. There's a very famous Swiss <coughs> philologist, Indo-Europeanist, named Ferdinand de Saussure. S-A-U-S-S-U-R-E. That's his last name. He was uh, truly a great scholar. He, his doctor, he was trained as an Indo-Europeanist. Does everybody know here what Indo-European studies means? Okay. okay. Indo-European. In Hindi textbooks, you get Indo Bharatiya. This is a perfectly good terminology. It means this. If you if you look at Sanskrit, this is going to turn into a long uh, ex exposition. If you look at Sanskrit and you look, let's say, at Latin. Now, Latin is a language that is attested first in the Italian peninsula modern-day Italy. And Sanskrit is, of course, first attested on the Indian subcontinent, long before the, the country called India or Mahara existed. And you notice certain similarities. So, for example, if you say pita in Sanskrit, there's another word in Latin that spelled P-A-T-E-R, pater, that means father. And they inflect, they have different forms, pranama, itiya, etc. They look very similar. <coughs> Similarly, if you have a word from mother, mata, there's a Latin word, M A T E R, mater, and it also means mother. If you have a Sanskrit word, mhada, there's a Latin word, now this becomes a little bit more tricky. Frater, F-A-R-T-E-R. But it means brother. Well, you say, how can, now, in the first word we had pita, and we had a P at the beginning of the word, and in Latin we have pater. You have a T in the middle of the word, and you have a T in the middle, in Sanskrit and a T in Latin. And you have a repa in Sanskrit and you have an R in Latin. Mater the same way. You have M, T, R, Makara, Takara, Repa. They all look the same. Now you have Mhata, Frater. They don't look, the, the T looks the same, the R looks the same, Takara, Repa, but now you have Mho in Sanskrit and F, F in Latin, structure. Well, if you consider another word, 
Sanskrit has Bharati. Latin has Fero. F-E-R-O means I carry. Well, Bharati means he carries. You have B-H-R-F-R-A. Say to yourself, well, you know, what it is is that they pair. That is, these are what are called systematic pairings of sound. And you've, you found terms that have the very same meaning. And uh, they match each other in systematic ways. And there's more than that. In Sanskrit, you say asti. Ayamasti, tvamasi, ahamasmi, te santi. In Latin, you have esti, e e s t i, means he is. And you have santi, which means that, I mean, you have sun, s u n t, which means they are. So you have the difference between a and e s and S, Esti and Sun. And you have in Sanskrit, Asti, A-S, and Santi, S plus an ending. Not only that, if you go to the past, what is the lung form of Asti? I'll ask you. You are students of Sanskrit. What is the lung form of Asti? Asti is the left form. What is the lung form? All together, tell me. I'm disappointed. <laughs> Maybe you know the what do they call it? How do they how do you refer to what do they use to refer to these? Is I say if it is Bhuta Kale Lung. How do you say Asti Ayam Asti Ayam Bhute Abhut? Hmm? No, no, not Marathi, please. Sans no, Asit. No, no, that's Agon Samanya Bhute. That's Anadhyatane. That's Anadhyatane, we don't want that. Are you, I mean, you've been taught Sanskrit, you have Vartamane Lat, then you have Bhute, Anadhyatane Lang. And then Parokshayli. So I want the one that is Samanye Bhute, the past in general, not Anadhyatane and not Parokshay. What would it be? A Bhut. What is the lut, the lit form? Babhuba. What is the lit form? Bhavishyati. Now notice, you have asti, asit, but abhut. Ah, now there's a sutra in Panini that says, aster bhuhu. That is, if you have an ardha dhatuka suffix to be used, then instead of the dhatu as, you have the dhatu bhu. You have two dhatus complementing each other. One occurs in one context, one occurs in another context. Now look in Latin, if you say he is, esti, he was, at some time in the past, fuit, f-u-i-t, which is for bhu. In other words, you have the same sort of shifting. Well, people looked at all of these things and said, you know, this is amazing. And they said, the, the scientific conclusion that was drawn from that was that Sanskrit and Latin and Greek and other languages, which were tested in India and in Europe, hence, were, were descendants of a single ancestral language that people labeled Indo-European. And just as you have a Mata, and she has a Patyani, so you have the mother tongue has descendants. 
and they're called daughter tongues or whatever. They're descendant languages. Now, Saussure was a student of this system, of the Indo-European languages. And to, to study these properly, you had to know Latin, Greek, at least Latin and Greek. You usually had to know Gothic and several other languages. And one language that was absolutely indispensable, required for Sanskrit. And he studied it, and he knew it quite well. And he, his doctoral dissertation, most people don't know this, was on what in Western languages people call the genitive absolute. Uh, for, for the Baninias in the audience, you know that Sanskrit has what I don't know what you call it in English. In, in classical studies, people speak of the locative absolute. That means nothing. But there's a sutra that uh, describes this usage. I mean, Panini says, yasya ca bhavena bhava lakshanam understood tatra saptam. Now, for example, if you have yasmin sati yad bhavati. Yes, asmin sati idam bhavati. Asmin asati idam na bhavati. Then by that you conclude that idam asya karanam. Now, asmin sati means if this is present, if this is true. And that is this usage of the saptami. Now the very next sutra, after Yasyatyam Havenam Havanakshanam, says Shashticha Anadare. Shashticha Anadare. Now this says that you can also use a Shashti under the same conditions. Yasyatyam Havenam Havanakshanam, Nakivanam Saptami Parantu Shashtyapi Prayujyate. Anadare. If there is non respect, show. So, Balakasya Rodataha, Gataha. He left because the child was crying. The child was crying, so he left. He left when the child was screaming or crying. So, Sio wrote a dissertation on the use of such genitives in the Mahabharata. And a lot of examples. And it was a very nice doctoral dissertation. Now, in addition to these studies, he gave a series of lectures when he was professor at the University of Paris on general linguistics. He never wrote a textbook. Uh, there's an interesting story about this that's maybe part, maybe is mythology, but it was it's recounted by his students that he would sit at a cafe in Paris and write his lectures and then he would deliver his lectures and tear them up. And I, I like that. And that's, in imitation of him, that's what I did. Because you, every time you give a lecture, you don't want to repeat what you said. You want to think again on the same subject. Rethink it. So that at least you have a, a new perspective. So it's true, I taught for 45 years, from the age of 24 to the age of 69. And I gave many, many lectures. I gave many lectures all over the world. And not a single lecture is on paper. Some of them I published as papers, but the lecture itself is never on paper. I tore them up. Why? This is is worthless. It's on paper. It should be here. So, he never wrote these lectures. His students took notes and had notebooks which several of his students compared and then composed a textbook on general linguistics which has had several versions because you, as every teacher knows, no student hears the same thing as any other student. If I go up and down and I look at the notes that students are taking, I'm astounded, I'm surprised to see 
how many things I have said that I didn't think I said. <laughs> they've written down, and they, that's their interpretation of what I said. And I said, do you really think I said that? Yes, sir. I said, that's not what I meant. Ah, but that's what I understood, sir. They always say, sir. You have to be polite. Well, these notebooks came out as a course in general linguistics. It was originally written in French, and then it was translated into English. And this had the effect of introducing, this, of introducing to the world the concept of structuralism, as people called it. And one of the main uh, things that he introduced into the study of language was the concept of language as the manifested stuff that you say and the underlying system that that represents. Uh, he used two different French words. Parole, parole, P-A-R-O-L-E, means what is said. And langue, L-A-N-G-U-E, is the language. And if you want to put it in roughly Indian terms, the language side of it is Shabda, or Sporta, the Sporta theory. And the Sporta is Yangya. It is that which is to be manifested. And the Yangyaka, the thing that manifests it, is what you say, the Dhani. The actual Dhani that you pronounce is a Yangyaka which triggers in your mind the sporta, which is related to the meaning, which is the true bhachaka. The true bhachaka is not the dhani that you have out there. That is what, what uh, Bhartri Hari calls the vaikriti bhak, the speech bhak, that is vaikriti, the, it is vikara stha, it occurs in the vikara, that is the deha. This is only a Vyandaka, a manifesto of the real language, which is the true communication. That is, I say something that represents a form, a, 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 a concretization of what I have in my head. You receive through your ears those sounds, and you convert them to the same thing as is in my head and is also in your head because we both command the same language. If I said what I'm saying right now in Spanish or French, you would not understand it, probably not understand it. I don't know how many of you speak Spanish or French. If I said it in Sanskrit, you probably would understand. But the, I'm speaking in English. I, they told me to speak in English. All of these things, I think, are better said in Sanskrit. And I would prefer to say it in Sanskrit. But I'm forced to speak English. Uh, well, that's all right. It doesn't bother me. Now, this had re repercussions for linguistics. It introduced the concept of structural linguistics, which had a long history until the 1950s, really, in which the so-called Chomskyan revolution took place. The reason that this is called a, a revolution, and the Chomskyan revolution claims to be closer to what linguistics really, every, everybody claims he's closest to the truth. Everybody claims he knows the truth, and nobody really does. And this structuralism had its effect not only on linguistics, but on literary theories. And now I learn on archaeology. I didn't know that structuralism had an effect on archaeology. I don't know how. And I'd be interested. New, New I'd, I'd like to know what 
what is meant by structuralism in new archaeology. So after I finish, I will pass it on to you. But that's that's my answer. So now you may answer me. My panini, will it lead to Okay. Well, a better methodology. I, as I get older, I, I get more and more convinced that we're only approximating what we want to find. It, when you're very young, you're extremely enthusiastic and you say, ah, I have discovered the truth. And then little by little you find how little you know. And as you, as you become more, as you learn more and more, you learn that you be, the, the famous Greek statement, Socrates, the great thinker, the great thing he said was that I know that I don't know. This is wisdom. To, to think, and this is Yagyavakya teaching in Sanskrit, to think that you know is to be ignorant because you don't really know the ultimate. To know that you don't know is to approach wisdom. And, and this is, as you get old, as you acquire more and more knowledge, you realize that that knowledge is slowly approaching but never getting to the ultimate. And how much Panini has influenced the West and how much it can influence are two different questions. How much it has truly influenced Western linguistics, I can probably say truthfully very little. Because the claims that structuralists and transformationalists have made that this is the way that we are representing Panini is really based on ignorance. They do really do not know how Panini system works. Consequently, whether Panini can really have an influence on modern linguistics is difficult to answer because you have to know Panini first to know whether it can have an influence on linguistics. And my answer there would be that it has had very true, really deep influence and it should have more influence, and we can hope it will. Now, archaeology. <laughs> In archaeology, uh, the traditional archaeology uh, will be trying to know what exactly happened and when. Because the archaeologists, with the help of their methodology, of the superimposition of layers could say that, well, this is an earlier artifact, this is a later one. And with other methods like the half-life, you can say, way of trying to measure the time, absolute timing, they could give a time reference to all the objects. That's what actually the archaeologists try to do. And then the new archaeologists, as they are called, and they were students of anthropology and linguistics, they said that instead of only trying to understand what happened when, it is better to know why it happened and how. And again, one of the best new archaeologist was from United States in the University of Albuquerque, Binford, Professor Binford. He, he said that, let us try to understand, in archaeological parlance we can say that, well, man through, underwent so many phases before he developed as a civilized person. First of all, he was something like a savage who gathered his food, then he became stationary and then started producing food and the third stage was civilization wherein he became urban and his life became more complex. 
So this was told by archaeologists that before some two lakhs of years, man was savage. Then about, say, 15,000 years ago, he became stationary, he started producing food, and that is called the Neolithic Revolution. And then he became urban before some 5,000 years. So those who had an understanding of archaeology from the point of view of anthropology and linguistics, they started posing questions. In a way, we have understood what way man developed. But why he changed himself from the savage attitude towards the uh, stationary, that is, you can say, when he started producing food, and when he became urban, that is, his life became more and more complex. So let us try to understand how it happened and why it happened. And in this, the analysis of the systems, as it is called, that is, the different systems that are there in human life, that is, his social life, then that is his economic basis, then his political life, and his religious life. So all these, the relationship all of all these systems, it is called the systems analysis, and that is based on structuralism. So you try to understand, and what is the role of mythology? And with the role, with better understanding of the role of mythology, again coming to language and myth and you can say symbols and their interpretations, there is something like post-structuralism. So uh, it is something similar to iconography and iconology as they call it in the interpretation. So in this uh, probably they have played a very important role. But I thought that uh, well, you might be knowing better after understanding Panini uh, how there can be possibilities of interpretation or new methodologies coming out of structuralism and beyond structuralism. That is how I, I, I thought that well, I could share some of my thoughts with you. Are there any other questions? Please, don't be shy. I, I find I, I almost have to use a needle to get students to talk. Yes. Is the young man there who's about to say something? The orange? You? <laughs> no? Okay. Well, no, I, let, let me first answer this young lady. Oh. Ask your question again, please. Uh, sir, you told about sport theory. Could you please explain more, a bit more? It's, it's very simple. Uh, if you... There was, a, there was an argument that was taking place sometime before Patanjali, that is before the second century BC. And th this had to do with what is it that signifies. Now the Mahabhashya, the very beginning, in the Paspasha, I don't know how many of you know the structure of the Mahabhashya. The Mahabhashya is Hmm? Is the Mahabhashya is a very famous commentary on Panini. It begins, Atha Shabdanu Shasanam, and then says, Keshan Shabdanam, Lokikanam, Vedikanam, Cha, and then goes on to ask a, a very pointed question. Atha Gauri Pyatra Kaha Shabdaha. What is meant is, if you say Gauhu, what is the Shabda there? Now this seems, looks like a simple question. But he goes on and discusses it and then he gives his answer and the answer is, I will say it very slowly, ye no charite na 
That element is the Shabda, Sa Shabdaha, by means of which Yena, once it has been Uttarita, I'm leaving the term untranslated, there is the cognition, the understanding, sampratyaya, sampratyayo bhavati, of objects which are langula, which have this uh, langula. I, I think the English word is dulap. I ne- that's the only place I've ever seen that word used, D-E-W-L-A-P. It's, uh, huh? oh, sasna. Sasna. Sasna, langula, kakuda, kuda. Langula, uh, sorry, sasna, not langula. Lunch is coming, I'm getting tired. Sasna, for this. The langula is, of course, the tail. Kakuda, he has a hump. Kura, he has hoofs and and Vishana, yes, one. Now, you have, a con- you have a cognition of these objects. So it is that which serves to make you understand that. Now, is that element, that Shabda, the Dhani, the sound itself? It cannot be. Why? Because Patanjali immediately goes on to say, Athava, Pratita padartha ka, pratita padartha ko loke shabdaha dhvani, dhvani hi ikyuchat. That is, in, in the world of normal yadahara, where we normally communicate, the word shabda means dhvani, the sound. And he gives examples. He says, Shabdam ma karshihi. Now that's, this does not mean don't utter a sound, it means stop making noise. Why? Because he says, Dhanim ma karshihi is what it means, don't make sounds. Therefore, by the previous, when he says, Ye no charitena sasna langura kakuda kura vishanina sampratyayo bhavati sa shabdaha. He must mean something other than dhvani, and therefore ucharita must, not, must mean something other than pronounced, uttered. It must be what Kayata says it means, namely abhiryakta, manifested. Now the assumption there is that the dhani by itself cannot be a signifier of meaning, cannot be the, the speech unit. Why? Well, in, in, in modern times we're used to writing. Everybody knows what a word in Marathi looks like, what a word in Hindi looks like, what a word in English looks like. You write it down and we say that's a word. But put yourself in the, in this, in the position where you're only hearing. You're not writing down. Right? Now, Patanjali says that sounds have a certain property, physical property. Shabdanam uccharita prabhansitvam. No sooner are they pronounced uccharitaha shabdaha then they disappear. There, there is dhamsa, dinasha, of these sounds as soon as they pronounce. That is, in the continuum of speech, as you utter sounds in space, there can only be one sound at once, and then that goes away, and then the next sound comes in, and the next one, so that you cannot have a samuha. a samudaya of all these sounds at once. This is different, for example, of a cloth, a piece of cloth, a pata. You have the tantavaha, the threads, 
that make up the cloth. Right? Now these threads can all occur at the same time. They're all here. I have the shirt on. I have threads in the shirt. Right? So you say Vastre Tantamahavartante. There are threads in the in the in the garment, in the thread in the in the, in the cloth. You cannot say that aneke shabdaha, dhani rupaha shabdaha, irani meva vartante, asmini vakshane, aneke shabdaha vartante, kutaha, shabdhanam pradhva, charita pradhansi, vat, yasmini vakshane, eka shabdaham charyate, tadanantaram, Tasyeva vinasho bhavati anyasyut pattihi bhavati. That is, that you have one sound disappeared and the next one comes up. So, what then is this shabda? It can't be the group of sounds because the sounds never occur together. So, the grammarian says there has to be something more. And that something more we call the true shabda or we call sporta which is a true linguistic unit. And there are three kinds in Bhatri Hari's theory. There is Varna Sporta, that is if I pronounce O, that articulated sound serves to manifest the Sporta O. And there is the Pada Sporta, if, if I say Rama, Ramaha, that all the different varnas there continue serve to manifest the pada sphota. And if I say Ramo Gramangachati, there is a single vakya which is a kandam vakya. It is in truth and actually Vastutaha a kandatvam. In truth, they are it is Atomic, A-T-O-M-I-C, it has no parts. But the sounds come and go. But the vakya, which signifies its meaning, is a vakya spota. Three kinds. And this is all that the spota theory says, that there's more to language than the physical elements. There are systematic elements which occur in your head. And this goes together with the theory of language, of speech. Bhartri Hari recognizes three levels of speech. Vakka. There is Vaikhari Vakka, there is Madhyama Vakka, and there is Pashyanti Vakka. And Pashyanti Vakka also has a Para Pashyanti version of it. And this is higher and higher levels. One, the Vaikhari Vakka is this Dhani, that is Shrotra uh, Grahya. It is perceptible by the ear. Then the Madhyama Vakya is not perceivable by the ear, it is in the head. It is in the, somewhere in your intellectual apparatus. But has uh, Krama. It still has this sequentiality to it. Now the Pashyanti Vak, on the other hand, now lacks even this Krama. It is something more abstract. And the Para Pashyanti Vak, by the time you get to that, you're to Brahma. But you have these levels of language, which is, we would say, the physical sound, the systematic language that's in your head, and these, nobody would deny that this is true, except that uh, the Sporta theory was made some big mystic, mystical something. It's nothing mystical. It's an absolutely uh, straightforward explanation of how language operates as a communicating system involving sounds and a code that 
speakers and hearers share. That's all it is. You can put it in five minutes. Although, books and books and books have been written about it. What is the meaning of, uh, what is Om and Sri in Sanskrit? <laughs> uh, what is the Om concept? Uh, Om Ike Kaksharam Brahma. That answer is for you. That's all you have to say. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm only half joking. It's a, it's a difficult issue because I'm, after all, later it's of course analyzing to ah, uh, um, ma, because you have to, because you have the long discussion of it. It's a mystical syllable. It's an akshara. And Shri, it depends on where, where you are on Shri. Shri originally simply means splendor, uh, wealth. But if you get to the Shri Yantra, you're, you're in another realm. So we have to always remember where we are. That is, in what context you're talking about these things. Uh, we are normally told in the university that uh, uh, so Sivar had a deep influence of uh, Bharatpruhari over him. So I wanted to know your opinion about it. I know that claim has been made. I don't believe it. I don't think he ever, I don't think he actually read anything from the Vakya Padmiya. There's no evidence for it. We, knew, we know he read the Kashika. We know he studied Mahabharata and other texts. Uh, whether he actually studied the Ashtanhyayi in and of itself and the Mahabhashya and other commentators and whether he actually sp studied the Vakyapadiya is uh, unanswerable, I think. But, but we definitely see a parallel between the concept of Shabda put forward by Patanjali and sign put forward by Sasyu, isn't it? Yes, that's fine. <coughs> the, the, <coughs> the, <coughs> the question is, there's a Latin phrase which lawyers always use. That is, poster hot uh, means F. B follows A. Ergo, therefore, propter hoc, therefore B is caused by A. This is not always true. And we must not forget that in Indian thinking, and this will be the, to establish that something is a karana of something else, you have to have two things. You say, Yasmin Sati Yad Bhavati. And also, that's the Anvaya. You also have to have the Yatireka. Yasmin Shasati Yad Bhavati. Tattasya Karana. Only if these two are met. So simply to say that B follows A does not stop. That only gives you the first part. Yasmin Sati Yad Bhavati. It doesn't give you the second part. So simply saying that something follows something else does not prove that what preceded caused what followed. So, okay. Thank you, Doctor. And before that, I would say that, well, friends, you are at the right age, and you have to take a decision. And I'm very selfish. I feel that from my college, maximum number of students should go for Sanskrit. And it's enjoyment. You can see. It's not only rote learning or it's just not reading books. It is a dialogue, Sanghwar. And that dialogue is with your life. It's a culture. So try to understand what you are learning from that point of view. And I'm sure you'll love Sanskrit because there's so much in it that uh, you will start understanding as if your life unfolds. You will find that there is everything in this Sounds good. I will enjoy it more. Well, friends, with these few words, 
I thank him on behalf of all of you. And I can tell you that here we have in this, uh, no, in management college. Most of you must be attending his lectures and from Monday onwards again he would start. And they are there up to 5th of March. So enjoy them and thank you. Thank you for all of you. Thank you.